Hi guys, welcome back to our virtual lab series, Back to the Future. My name is Anushka and I'm a science communicator at the Center for Predictive Human Model Systems or CPHMS as you know us. In today's episode, we're going to learn how non-invasive imaging techniques are used to understand attention and behavior in human brains. Have you found it difficult to stop binge watching that new Netflix series for hours on end? Or have you ever struggled to pay attention in that boring lecture on that boring subject even for a few minutes? It's pretty hard to keep yourself from reaching for your phone in those times, isn't it? Well, it turns out your brain is doing hundreds of different things at the same time just to get you to try and focus. Today we'll be taking you to Dr. Sridharan Devrajan's Cognition, Computation and Behavior Lab at the Indian Institute of Science. This lab studies how the human brain works with powerful, non-invasive imaging techniques. 21st century neuroscience faces a grand challenge. How do the 86 billion neurons in a brain, in our human brain, and that's billion with a B, how do they all coordinate to produce behavior? In fact, one of the main challenges is for us to understand how these neurons help us pay attention, uh, help us make critical decisions, help us ignore distractions, and so on and so forth. So I'm Sridharan Devarajan, and uh, here at the Center for Neuroscience uh, in the Cognition, Computation, and Behavior Lab, we use a range of non-invasive techniques, including functional MRI, diffusion MRI, uh, non-invasive brain stimulation techniques like uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation to understand how all of these wonderful behaviors emerge from the brain and also to perturb the brain and study the effect of these perturbations on behavior. So these techniques allow us to measure many important things about the brain like uh, which parts of the brain become active when somebody is paying attention or which connections between particular brain areas uh, can predict somebody's ability to pay attention or if we stimulate or shut down a particular part of the brain how does it affect someone's attention abilities so let's say a school student is unable to pay attention in a sustained manner or gets easily distracted or an elderly patient who's walking down the road suddenly forgets their way home now, which circuits in the brain are getting impaired? And can we do something to help them? Can we do something to uh, reduce this impairment or sometimes even reverse it? And these are all the questions that we are exploring with these techniques in our lab. Now, importantly, uh, these techniques are all non-invasive. They are very safe and uh, many of them are FDA certified and they are completely benign for human use. And therefore, we can study all these questions directly in the human brain without recourse to model organisms. Think of your eyes as cameras that take pictures of the world. These pictures travel to your brain through a special road called the visual pathway. It starts at the retina in the back of our eyes, where light-sensitive cells called photoreceptors gather visual input. Then. This information travels through the optic nerve to a part of the brain called the thalamus, which acts like a relay station. Now from the thalamus, the visual information heads to the visual cortex. Here, the brain starts to make sense of the basic features like edges, colors and shapes in what we see. Attention is a cognitive process that allows us to focus on important things and filter out other irrelevant things. When we pay attention to something, different brain regions get involved. These brain areas work together like a team to let us notice things, recognize them, and decide what's essential in our surroundings. Among the different types of attention are overt and covert attention. When we pay overt attention, we move our eyes in the direction of an object. On the other hand, covert attention allows us to spy on objects at the edge of our vision, even without moving our eyes toward them. Using non-invasive neuroimaging tools like functional MRI and EEG, scientists can visualize brain activity and identify the areas of the brain that drive these processes.
Let's revisit that boring lecture that we were struggling with. Is there a way to reduce the struggle? Just like television and radio sets of the olden days, where you had to play around with knobs to get better signal, what if we could find such knobs in our brains? Wouldn't it be great if you could tune these knobs? Our brain communicates all the time through electrical signals. And there is one such knob that can tweak the electrical activities. Transcranial Magnetic Stimulation or TMS. On the day of the experiment, the participant will come into the TMS room after signing a consent form. They are seated in a comfortable chair and a subject tracker is tied around their forehead to track their head via an infrared camera connected to a computer. After this, we attach electrodes to the fingers of the participant to measure the resting motor threshold. Now, we use a pointer to locate the major landmarks on our participant's face. This is done to reconstruct the exact position of their head using a previously acquired MRI scan. By moving the pointer on the surface of the scalp, we validate this reconstruction. Next. We plug the TMS coil into the magnetic stimulator. The coil can be used to stimulate specific areas of the brain in a focused manner. The area of interest of the brain is precisely located using a real-time movement tracker. Here, we can see the reconstructed brain on the screen as the coil moves. TMS uses a magnetized coil to induce electric currents and stimulate nerve cells in specific parts of the brain. This can increase or decrease activity in these brain regions with millisecond precision. One experiment conducted in our lab shows very interesting results. Participants were asked to pay attention to two locations of different relevance. Intelligent participants would pay more attention to the more relevant of the two locations. Reasonable participants would also sometimes switch attention to the less relevant location, just in case something interesting is happening there. This ability is called reorienting. Using TMS, we briefly suppress the electrical activity of a region called the posterior parietal cortex. After TMS, we found that participants could not easily reorient their attention, that is, they remained locked on their first attended location even when something important was happening at the other location. This suggests that the PPC helps us flexibly switch attention, which is an important cognitive ability. Can you imagine peeking into someone's brain to decode what they are thinking or dreaming about? Scientists in the field are using fMRI together with powerful new advances in artificial intelligence to take a snapshot of the brain. These snapshots helps us understand how and what things people pay attention to. We want to pinpoint what the participant is paying attention to by visualizing metabolic activity in the brain using fMRI. We start by collecting structural MRI scan you can think of this as a high-resolution static snapshot of the brain. This helps us accurately identify different parts of the brain based on well-known landmarks. Then we collect functional MRI scans, which is more like a video of the brain activity that unfolds as the participant views different pictures inside the scanner. So the scanner has a big magnet and any objects with magnetic properties can interfere with the scanning or pose the risk to you or the machine. So before we take you into the scanner, uh, we need you to fill in this screening form to make sure that there's no metal on or inside your body. The participant is given scrubs to change into as certain fabrics may interfere with the scanner and be unsafe. They are scanned with a metal detector to make sure no obstructive objects are on them. 
Now you will be going inside the scanner. Since there is a lot of noise, you would like to put in the earplug. Once they enter the scanning room, the participant lies down on the scanner table and we make sure they are comfortable. They are handed response grips for the task and the scanning head coil is fixed in place. Once the scan begins, the participant will perform the task. Researchers view which part of their brain lights up as they see each image. Alright, so are we doing good? Yes. So we'll start the scan soon. You can relax for now. How do we infer what the participant is viewing from the fMRI activity? For this, we take advantage of the fact that different parts of the brain have specialized preferences or functions. Take two brain areas, the fusiform area or the FFA and parahippocampal place area or PPA. Both are parts of the higher visual cortex. Neurons in FFA like to respond to faces or even face-like objects and neurons in PPA like places. We show the participant pictures of faces, houses and some neutral images like checkerboards as you can see on the screen. The FFA lights up when we show faces but not the other images. Likewise, the PPA lights up when we show houses but not faces. Based on which brain area lights up, we can pretty accurately guess what the participant was seeing. And the amazing thing is that we can do all of this in real time. We have already seen that we can roughly tell what class of images the participant is viewing. But can we go one step further to reconstruct exactly what the participant is looking at using their fMRI scans? For example, if the participant is looking at a house, does it have a roof? How many windows there are? What is the color of the door? To do this, we will use machine learning and deep learning tools. Machine learning is a process of teaching a computer program to learn patterns from the data. The trained program is called a machine learning or ML model. Think of this model like a child learning concepts from a question bank using question answer pairs. In the same way, we provide input output pairs to train the ML model. To know whether the child has actually learned useful concepts and not just memorize the answers, we test the child on similar but not the same questions. Similarly, we test the ML model on unseen inputs to know if it has learned the right patterns and can tackle new questions. Deep learning or DL takes this one step further by allowing us to use even more complex inputs and outputs. In this case, the inputs and outputs could be images, text, videos, or even brain scans. In the experiment we just did, the question-answer pair is the image and corresponding brain fMRI activity. When given an image, the model must be able to predict the brain activity it would produce. We call this the encoder. Next, we train another ML model called the decoder by turning the encoder model on its head. Now, if we give the decoder fMRI activity, it must reconstruct the viewed image pixel for pixel. In this experiment, our participants viewed a sequence of images while we recorded the functional MRI scans of their brain. Then, we tested two of our deep learning models, which have been training for a while now. On studying these scans, our model generated an image what they understood would have evoked the particular response in the participant. How well do you think our model did on its task? This setup can also help us understand attention disorders. Suppose we show an image of a person on a motorbike to a participant and ask them to focus on the bike and ignore the rider. What if the rider and not the bike gets reconstructed from their brain scan? Perhaps this happened because the participant was unable to pay attention properly. We can then dig deeper to understand why this happened and possibly find ways to fix this. Have you ever sat down to work but found yourself mindlessly scrolling to Instagram many years later? Don't worry, you're not the only one. In today's fast-paced world, distractions are everywhere. Videos are getting shorter and maybe so is our attention span. 
children and even young adults are increasingly diagnosed with attention disorders such as ADHD. Such individuals might find it hard to pay focused attention and get easily distracted. On the other hand, elderly people might also find it hard to concentrate, a problem that may increase as they age. Normally, pharmaceutical drugs are prescribed to help enhance attention. But there can be undesirable side effects. We ask, is there a way to train people's brain to pay attention for longer periods? The paradigm we explore is called neurofeedback. We use a non-invasive method called EEG to record electrical brain signals that can tell us whether a participant is paying attention or not. If their attention lapses, we provide them with corrective feedback to help drive their attention back up, just like a teacher calling out a dozing backbencher. We start with the volunteer coming in and filling out an informed consent form, indicating their willingness to participate in the experiment. We then take measurements of their head to select a properly fitting EEG cap. Once they are comfortably wearing the cap, we inject conducting gel in the holes of the cap with a syringe. This gel allows electrical activity from the scalp to flow to the EEG electrodes. Over 100 electrodes are fitted into the cap, one in each holder. The participant is then seated in the experiment room with their head resting on the chin rest facing an LED monitor. The experiment is now ready to begin. EEG data recording starts as soon as the participants begin to do the task. There are two gratings visible through the eye tracker. Participants must fix their gaze on the plus sign and arrow in the center while focusing covertly on the stimuli that the arrow points to. The smaller grating inside the bigger one will begin to rotate as the participant pays attention to the cued location. The goal of the participant is to align the inner and outer gratings. If the participant loses focus, the grating will stop rotating and reset. As soon as the gratings are aligned, a new target is set and the participant must try to achieve as many alignments as they can. Points are given for each alignment. The better the score, the better your focus. The EEG reading in blue and yellow measures how much attention is paid to each individual grating, and the one below measures the difference between the two. From this, we can understand which side the participant is focusing on in real time. Using this data, we train an ML model to accurately predict the attention levels on the left and right sides from the EEG signals. That brings us to the end of today's virtual lab. We hope your neurons are firing and look forward to all of your interesting questions in the next P2F circle. With this episode, we also come to the end of the Back to the Future series. It's been a wonderful journey and we hope that each episode taught you something new and exciting about the world of biological research and all of the exciting work that Indian researchers are doing. You can stay in touch with us by signing up for our updates to keep learning about all the cool work we do at CPHMS in the field of human relevant research. See you soon!